Good morning, Northridge. Good to see you all here. I'm going to open with a scripture this morning from Psalm 63, and I'd ask you to stand with me as I read this. So you could find your seat and then stand up. Thanks. You, God, are my God. Early, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come here this morning to worship you, help us to quiet our minds, to focus on you. As we sing and we worship, help us to leave our worries, our cares with you and take this time to dwell in your presence. Amen. to pray. Yeah. 
Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this precious time of being in your presence in this place in worship. Thank you for meeting us here and for filling us with you today. We're so blessed to get to have this time to worship you together, God. Amen. It's time for you to greet your neighbor. I think that today you should tell them, I'm blessed to be here. All right, let's have a seat. Hello, church family. My name is Anne, for those of you I haven't met before. It's a blessing for me to be up here with you today. I have a two-minute talk to give you. I hope it's only two minutes. Teachers are not known for being short sometimes with their words. So um, I wanted to share that yesterday I, w I had the privilege of attending a memorial service for a relative that I actually didn't get to spend a lot of time with, but I was really fortunate to be able to be there and learn more about her life. And the stories at this service were amazing. This was a woman who cast a wide net, we said. The hall was very full, and there were, I think there were six speakers who spoke of how much care she showed for people and about her generosity. Um, and so one of the stories that really stuck with me was that her nephew shared that she, he, ha he had discovered, they live on Vancouver Island, and he'd seen these two cyclists. There'd been this enormous downpour of rain that had come on really suddenly, and he saw these two cyclists kind of stranded, and they looked like they were probably camping. They had a lot of gear. And he pulled over, and he, he offered them some help, and you could see they were just drenched, and he thought, I know, I know who they need. And he thought of his aunt who had a, a, a home with a suite inside it. And he, he just knew if he called her, she would say, oh, bring them over. So he did. And she invited this, these two cyclists. They were from Europe or something. And anyway, they came in and she shared what she had with them. She um, said, yeah, stay in my suite. Oh, and I've made dinner and I'm going to have dinner with you. And so gave them a lovely meal, gave them warm plates, dried all their gear in their dryer had a lovely evening with them because that was the kind of hostess she was. And that wasn't all, though. The next morning, they set off ready to bike again on their biking tour of Vancouver Island with all their dry gear. And they had taken off of the town, and they're on the highway. And he told the, the, the cyclist told the nephew this story later that um, they had been heading out of town, and this truck pulled alongside them. And <laughs> out came Daphne saying, yoo-hoo, which apparently was her saying, and said, said, I've got these warm muffins from the farmer's market. You have to take these with you so that you have one more thing for your trip. And I heard this story and I thought, I want to be the person who drives after people with warm muffins. I w that's what I want to do. I want to have that kind of giving for people that just goes extra, right? And, and so that, it, was, it was wonderful to hear those stories. So when I think of our tithes and our offerings, I think about the fact that we give a percentage of what we have. And Daphne shared her home. She shared the home she had. She had a suite. She was able to, she was kind of giving a piece that she had. I have a bed for you. I have a dryer. And she gave that. But she went extra, and she found that offering. And she, she chased them down with muffins. And I thought about how I would love to not just give my tithe, but to also find those ways to give that extra piece. So I, I hope that resonates with you today, but, um, but it, was, it was a great story that I, I really enjoyed yesterday. We're going to invite my dear friend Kara Lee up right now. We're going to pray for her, and I'd like to invite Gord and Jean Ann Demchuk to come and pray over her. Kara Lee is one of my dearest friends, and she is so faithful, and so we're going to be blessing her as she goes to Costa Rica. All right. <laughs> you are so well loved. We are your family and we love you. And uh, Carolee leaves on Thursday. So we're all going to commit as a family that we're going to pray for you every single day. Put it on your list because if you're old, you'll forget. So uh, put Carolee's name down on your fridge, uh, even in the bathroom, uh, where you go often that you'll remember to pray for her. So, Lord, we pray for Carolee this morning that you wouldn't just fill her 
with your spirit that you would overflow. Mm -hmm. That she has many muffins to mm -hmm. chase down every Costa Rican that comes across her path. That they will know that they weren't just blessed by God. They were extra blessed. Mm -hmm. So, Lord, we feel we're sending our best because we're sending Carol Lee in your name. So fill her with your spirit. Give her a clear understanding of what the spirit is saying and how mm -hmm. to effectively pray for all those that God puts in her path. Father, we are so grateful that you call us, that you call us to do things that maybe we're not always comfortable with, but Lord God, you give us the ability and the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge to do it. And so Lord, we pray all these things on Carolee as she goes to Costa Rica. Father, I also want to extend our prayers to the entire team that's going, Lord. Would you bless them? Would you guide them? Would you encourage them? Father, we thank you for Lana and John, our missionaries there, who are, uh, I assume, are heading all this up. Lord, I pray that you will bless them. But Lord, I think of all the ones that I've met over the years in Costa Rica, and I know they're going to embrace Carolee and love her. But so, Lord, I know she'll come home blessed too. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that as she is there in that country, that you'll just reveal to her very quickly exactly what you would have her to do and she will know that although she may not understand the language she'll be able to communicate well with those people because we're doing it through your spirit lord god so lord bless the team bless carolee may it be a wonderful time and we look forward to hearing all the things that happen lord we pray these things in christ's name amen I'm going to pray for our tithes and offerings now. And I'm also going to, do, oh wait, no, I'm going to pray for the tithes and offerings. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give. Show us where we can find our extra to be a blessing with our giving. Amen. I'm going to also ask a blessing on our middle schoolers, our high schoolers, and we're going to send them off to Sunday school. So enjoy. No, it's not Sunday school. It's kids' church. But it's on Sunday, and it's schoolish, so have fun in your class. <laughs> I have some announcements. Okay, this is exciting. There's an Amparo International Fundraiser Golf Tournament. It's coming on Friday, October 7th. Ryan Douglas, I guess he must be a golfer as well as a hockey player. He tries, I heard. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can connect with Ryan, or you can, uh, you can email somebody. Oh, good. Oh, look, a screen. Great. Okay. So there's a, there's a link there. Okay. Um, Alpha is coming. There's a great crew that's ready to lead it. Isn't that great? Yay, Alpha. Can I see, just to show of hands, how many people have been impacted by Alpha in some way? My husband went to Alpha, and I'm really glad that he did. That worked out really well for me, that, that he went to Alpha. So um, definitely, Alpha is something that you want to do. We actually led an Alpha table together at one point. So that's, but it's a great class, even if you've done it before. It, it would be really wonderful. It, um, it's also a great chance to invite someone to explore their faith questions. So if there's somebody you're thinking of, pray about that. You can invite them. Alpha starts on Thursday, October 6th, and runs until December 14th. Alpha is a course for people who have questions about their faith and new believers. Great question. Thank you. So, yeah, anything you want to know, and it's very low pressure, and it's a really, it's a very friendly environment for people who, who don't know Jesus yet and might have some questions about it. And um, I, But I feel like it's for believers, whether you're at the start of your faith or in the middle or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think that's my announcements, and I would love to welcome David, our speaker today. Woohoo! Is right. Well, thank you, Anne. And first order of business, Anne's got a great voice, but I mine's annoying, and so if you wouldn't mind turning me down just a little bit. In fact, speaking of Anne's great voice, we go back, way back. Actually, we share a bond with Stephen McMillan, the drummer. Anne and Stephen are of a similar age. Actually, you're even younger. You're just smart, so you skipped a grade. Um, but I, Anne and Stephen and my sister and many others were in grade 8 when I was in grade 10 at Millard Junior Secondary in Coquitlam. 
and uh, we were put together randomly. We both applied to be uh, radio hosts for the morning announcements, and we applied as singles, and so we were put together and forged an incredible duo. I think they still talk about it to this day uh, at Millard. Yeah, legendary. I still feel a little bit loud, Josiah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make something really clear. Uh, just, I, I don't, this isn't in my notes, but I am very much in love with my wife. I, I've noticed that we don't often sit together, and you guys might be wondering, how's it going with David and Carol Lee? Like, um, are they okay? We're doing great, <laughs> all right? I love her a lot. I get really distracted when I sit next to my wife. Um, I get a little handsy, and she doesn't like that at church. And so, uh, no, that's not the reason. I'm, I, I usually have to abandon them partway through the service. My poor kids are dying right now. Um, okay, I should probably... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I should probably stick to my notes. Um, okay, today we get to do something really fun that we haven't done for a while. Um, today, Matt and Alex Connor have made the decision to dedicate baby Silas. Um, now, the timing of this is a little bit on the nose for, for what we're teaching and everything. First, we're teaching a series called The Gifts. And uh, those of you who have parented before, who have kids, you know that our children are truly a gift, uh, even when they're old and make fun of you from the congregation. Um, but they are a gift. And so there's that. But secondly, today specifically, we're teaching about teaching and leading as spiritual gifts. And those of you who know uh, Matt and Alex know that they are teachers by profession. And uh, they serve as leaders and have served as leaders in our church since the dawn of time. And so it is a little on the nose that um, this is all happening today, but I think it's, it's perfect. And I'm very excited. It's an honor to be blessing you this morning. Why don't you guys come on up and we'll put this really cute picture up of Silas Psalm Connor. I was just saying I have never held Silas. I was offered early and um, I wasn't feeling well. So is it okay if I hold him now? I'm just going to let this breathe. I'm as, as distracted as you are. Holy moly, he's cute. Um, one of the things that we should say off the bat is we dedicate babies as opposed to baptizing them. Baptism is a thing that um, we believe and we reserve for a decision that, that they make. So today we're not baptizing uh, Silas. That's something you can choose later on. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> Today, it's actually, it's about Matt and Alex uh, making a decision uh, to dedicate Silas, to choose to dedicate their, their parenting and their time and their energies towards parenting you for Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Uh, one of the things we love to do is, is we love to talk about the name that you've been given, actually the names you've been given. And his first name, as you can see on the screen, is Silas. And many of you know the character uh, the man from the Bible named Silas. And it was interesting. I was looking up um, the origin and meaning of the words. And uh, it, apparently it comes from the Latin silva, which means wood. And so a common uh, meaning for the name Silas is man of the forest or man of the woods. Uh, but we uh, did a little more digging. And uh, there's an Aramaic meaning as well. And it means prayed for. And uh, if you are a member of the extended family, um, and really, even a member of our church family, uh, you know that this young man, this little boy, was prayed for long before he was even uh, out in the world, out in the wild. And so prayed for is a, sorry, I said my P really loud in your face. Uh, prayed for is a, is a great first name for you. And then Psalm, you know, Psalm, we, we're familiar with the Psalms, and um, its meaning is, is a sacred song or even a hymn. <laughs> well, one of the things uh, that I love about the Psalms is there is an authenticity uh, displayed by the psalmists. There, there's something where I, I think unlike anywhere else in the Bible, we see um, a realness uh, by the writers. It's not just good advice. Oh, 
you were going to leave me? I thought you were going to leave me for a second there. It's not just good advice. It's not just, or just, I would do air quotes if I had any more arms. Um, but it's, it's the, the writer is talking about real, in the moment feelings. Sometimes he's just mad at the way things are going. And he feels at liberty to share that with God. Sometimes he's frustrated and sometimes he's celebrating. And I think there's something really beautiful. Are you taking a turn? <laughs> there you go. Something really beautiful about that authenticity, about how it's, it's not just the good news that, it get, that, that gets shared. And so, Silas, when we, we look at those things together, and I need to flip my page here just a second. No, this is how I want to say this. My prayer and blessing over Silas Song Connor is that he will continue to be covered in prayer by our church community and the family he's been blessed to be born into. Additionally, I pray that he, is al he always knows God's desire to be in authentic relationship with you. He doesn't just want to hear from you when things are good. He wants to hear from you all the time. He wants to walk with you authentically. Um, one of the traditions that we've started, and I don't want to do this because now he's cuddling, um, but I'm going to give him back to you, Alex. One of the things we've done, and I, I'm actually going to invite the, the family to come up for this as well, is uh, if you, you can come up right now, beautiful, is we've started to, uh, or we've started, we, we established a tradition, actually Rob, uh, founder of our church, uh, established this tradition of um, exchanging vows with the mom and dad, but then the final vow is for all of us. Um, I like to do this in weddings as well, where uh, we're invited not just to be spectators. Uh, church was never meant to be a spectator event. Uh, you are invited to be a part of this. You are a part of the village. You are a part of the group that was praying uh, for Silas, and you're invited to be a part of his village as he gets raised up. I look at some of the kids here, here and, and we'll be sneaking off to Sunday school. Um, Silas is going to be a part of this. He's going to be a part of our village. And so the last vow is for you as well. But first, Matt and Alex, do you promise to raise Silas with patience and gentleness, lovingly instructing him and disip discipling him? Good answer. Do you promise to keep your marriage strong so you model for Silas the kind of life he can have if he follows God? And finally, do you promise to pray with him and for him that he would put his faith in God early in his life? And to your family and friends, and friends, do we promise to support the Connors, holding them up in our prayers and encouragement and providing other models of right living for Silas to follow? We do. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this family. What a blessing this family has been to our church. Uh, and I know that uh, the wake of their influence is much broader than just Northridge. Um, I think of the discipleship that happens in their classrooms uh, in Matt and Alex's classroom, the opportunity they have to work with their 30 kids for 10 months of the year and uh, the impact that they can have on their lives. Lord, we pray for that impact um, exponentially happening in the life of Silas, Lord, this intentional opportunity for discipleship, that they will be able to love him and care for him, protect him and nurture him, bless him as he grows strong. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, family. You've done well. Silas, you're the winner. Good job. <laughs> My glasses are fogged up. I can't see anything that's going on. Okay. Yeah, those of you who know the Connors, you know that they're a special family to us, and uh, we're thankful for their impact. Um, all right. So moving into the time in the Word, I want to do a quick review. I was really impacted. I, I love being able to sit where you're sitting now and, and receive the Word from uh, a gifted teacher like Pastor Les. And, and he did a wonderful job of, of really kicking off this new series. Um, uh, did you know also that Les has written a companion book to go along with this? Uh, if you're not a part of our, our mailing list, we send out a, an e-magazine once a month. And uh, in it would have been a link to uh, get this ebook. Um, if you have not received that but you'd like to, 
you can email me directly, david at nrchurch.ca, and I would be happy to hook you up with a copy of the book. It's a, it's a great companion piece. Les did a really good job of, of kind of sticking closer to the book he wrote it, for crying out loud. Uh, I'm going to, I've used that as a resource, and I'm coming at it from a bit of a different angle, and, but it would be really good for you to look and listen to what I'm saying right now. Don't start reading the book instead of listening to me. But then uh, refer back to this book that he's written, and espe uh, especially the chapter he's written on teaching and leadership. And they will hopefully um, uh, complement each other very, very well. So the review goes like this. Um, when we employ the gifts well, we give credit to the giver. We do these things in his name. That's the first thing I want to say. This, so when we share the gifts we've been given, this can bring glory to the giver. The next point is this. We should never do things in his name lightly. And I, I don't want that to be ominous. Uh, but sometimes we kind of throw it out there. Well, God told me this. Or God be told me to do this. Or even more precarious is when we kind of frivolously say, yeah, I think God's telling you to do this. We've got to be really careful with how we uh, assign God's word to something that Pastor Les jokingly said could just be indigestion. Uh, it's just so, it's something to be aware of. Third point of review, I want to say, with a healthy measure of reverence, we should be activating the gifts that we're given. So I don't want to I don't want to scare you out of uh, speaking things in God's name if that's what He's giving for you to speak. But it's with a healthy measure of reverence. We should be activating those gifts that we've been given. What a waste if you've, and we're not necessarily talking about a spiritual gift of singing, but if you've been gifted with a beautiful voice and all you ever do is sing to yourself in the shower, what a waste of a gift. And so when we are given gifts, they're meant to be used. And the fourth thing that I, I really just kind of marinated in this week is we can be excited to learn about and employ the gifts that we've been given. I don't know about you, but I am excited about unraveling or revealing uh, the list of spiritual gifts that we're going to be working through. And, and I want to hear the stories. I want to I see you light up when you start to realize, wait a minute, I think I've been given that gift. I think God gave me that gift. And first, well, to go beyond just identifying that you've been given a gift, and start to realize that you've been called to employ that gift. You've been called to activate it. You've been called to work within that gift to be a blessing to others. So those are the things that I've, I, I know it's not a summation of what Les said, but I was, I've been stewing on that all week and it's been a blessing to me. So today we're looking at two new gifts. We're looking at the gift of teaching and the gift of leadership. Again, it's a fun coincidence that Matt and Alex Connor decided to have Silas dedicated today. Both of them are teachers at Pacific Academy, which is the school I taught at for many, many years. And they have shared their gift here as teachers and leaders for years. So let's look at teaching. This is the fourth gift that we've looked at so far. That's why you have the number four before the teaching. So similar to words of wisdom and words of knowledge, teaching can begin with a natural gift. Let me explain this very carefully. Um, there are people who don't yet know Jesus who are really, really good teachers and leaders, to be honest. They are excellent teachers. Sometimes it's in their DNA. Uh, there's a, a long-standing history of educators in, in the Connors family. And so there's, there's just, sometimes it's just good DNA. It's modeled for you. Sometimes you've gone to school at Matt is actually... I don't know how close you are to finishing your Master's of Leadership this close. In 2021, I think you're this close. So um, I don't know. I'm excited for you. I shouldn't be making fun of the guy we just dedicated his, chid, his kid. Um, but there, there's, this, there's an ability to develop it as a skill. So in the natural, there is a skill of teaching. There's a skill of leadership. Uh, I have worked under people who don't yet know Jesus or didn't at the time but who were outstanding teachers and outstanding leaders. So it can begin with this very natural gift. Second point I want to make here, 
when anointed by the Holy Spirit, the gift of teaching takes on a form with new depth. Now here's the thing. I have this growing personal portfolio of experience in this regard. And before you think, oh, well, that's kind of arrogant of you to say this, David. Um, let, wait till you hear the story and you'll hear that I'm just the knucklehead who gets to tell the story. Um, there have been times, so my, my background is teaching as well. So I've, I've, I've spent time, uh, I've been in education for over 30 years now. I still, on the side, I've got 150 students again this year uh, who I teach online. And this is something I've been a part of for a long time. I have a master's in education focusing on curriculum instruction. So I've de been developing this skill over the years. Um, and there are some times, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, there are some times where I have crafted a sermon for you and I come to church, and I'm like, come on, play that song faster. I've got amazing things to say. And I'm so proud and ready to deliver this sermon that I think is so good. It should be called the Book of David, and maybe not put in the Bible, but maybe tuck it in behind your Bible. I don't know. And it's in uncanny how often I come in full of pride in what I can do as a teacher, and I get crickets during the service, and maybe the occasional pat in the back. Good job, Pastor. And then there are those days where nothing goes right. Where it just, have you had those days where it's just like you can't form sentences and you just feel like you can't communicate? Or there's days where I'm distracted by somebody in the audience or a, a thing that's going on and I just, I just don't feel like it. And I honestly, uh, you may notice this every once in a while, I sometimes try and make a quick exit. Like, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just wanted, I want this Sunday to be done with. And you know what? It's uncanny how often on those days when I feel like I haven't done my best work, I get the most specific um, feedback from what God has said to people in that service. And it's, it's one of those things that I don't think I can do it justice with my testimony for how God does this. But he does it so consistently, and it's so obvious to me that the things that sink deep, the things that truly matter, the nuggets that take root and are good seeds, are almost never anything to do with my skill, my brilliance, and almost always has something, well, everything to do with the Holy Spirit wanting to move in the lives of this, peop of this group of people. And so when we look at this statement, when anointed by the Holy Spirit, the gift of teaching takes on a form with new depth. What I'm not saying is I have been gifted with the gift of teaching and I'm going to sprinkle what I have of my spiritual gift on you like I'm some gatekeeper of a spiritual gift. But what I'm saying is there is a new kind of depth that comes when the Holy Spirit is involved and exercises this, this gift of teaching. And when he does his thing, does that make sense? Let me go a little bit deeper um, into, the, into the points here. The third point is this. The gift of teaching is a God-given ability to properly interpret and explain God's word to others. Well, now, while this is true, I can testify that there are times when I don't feel like I've properly interpreted or explained anything. Uh, that's when I can see the spiritual nature of the gift. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about my skill or lack thereof. It's God using and wielding a spiritual gift for his purpose. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm still called to work hard. I'm called to study diligently and to, and to prepare. But my greatest asset or, or our greatest asset that we can make available is to be obedient. And and keep this in mind when we, uh, un when we reveal other spiritual gifts throughout the weeks coming up. When you've been given a spiritual gift, the best way to wield that spiritual gift is to be obedient. To listen to what God has to say and listen and respond to the call to exercise that gift. Fortunately, the kingdom work isn't reliant on my eloquence or brilliance. Aren't we thankful for that? Yeah. Hey, don't be so quick to agree. Anyways, that's enough of my words for now. Let's see what the scriptures teach us about teaching. We're going to look at Luke 4. We're actually going to go through a several um, different passages, but let's start in Luke 4, verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a, ci a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. 
and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And this, can, do you ever, okay, I taught, uh, part of my teaching was in a Christian school, and we had this thing called a Becca math. Is anybody familiar with the a Becca math program? My wife is, there you go. We get, we're so, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> a Becca math was basically called Christian math because they put a memory verse at the top of a math page. It was really quite ridiculous. And, and I want to be really clear, that's not what this is. Even though it's just a short passage, uh, there's something really powerful in here. This idea they were astonished at his teaching for his word possessed authority. We're not told what it is that Jesus taught, but we're told of the effect his teaching had on his audience. They were astonished. They had never heard anybody teach quite like this before. Here's another example from Matthew 7. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Different situation, but they were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. Now, they, it, it's important to note that he taught from a position of authority. The scribes who taught them were repeating what they had been taught. They were middlemen. They were messengers passing on the traditions and the, the writings and, the, and the, the teachings of their forefathers or people who had come before them. But with Jesus, he had this inherent authority because he was speaking the words of his father, the author of all of these words. It was him coming in authority and, and revealing God's word to them. Where the scribes acted as messenger boys, passing notes they've received from others, Jesus spoke with his own voice and authority that comes from being God's son. Uh, actually, I just stole the thunder of a quote from F.F. F. Bruce, but let's read it anyways. Um, the scribes spoke by authority. Excuse me. The scribes spoke by authority, resting all they said on traditions of what had been said before. Jesus spoke with authority out of his own soul. So, okay, we're going to move now from the teaching of, uh, uh, topic of teaching with a review of one of our primary texts. Let's look in Romans 12, beginning in verse 3. For the by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same functions. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Uh, excuse me, members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let's use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. He begins, well, this part of the passage, by saying not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Paul does not take, tell the, the reader or the listener to take on this attitude that finds pleasure in, in humiliation or degradation. Rather, the idea is that we should see the truth about ourselves and live in light of it. When we see ourselves as we really are, it's impossible <laughs> to be given over to pride. When we do that self-examination, we, when we know the true bits about ourselves, our brokenness, our imperfections, it's kind of hard to get too prideful. And then he says the measure of faith, that, he refers to the measure of faith that God has assigned. This means we should see even our saving faith as a gift from God. That we have no basis for pride or a superior opinion of ourselves. And then he starts to describe that we are one body with many members. So we're talking about the church. We're one. There's a unity here. But there's many members within this oneness. There's a uniqueness. There's unity, but there's also uniqueness. We are made differently. Unity should never be promoted at the expense of individuality. Does that make sense? And individuality should never diminish the church's essential unity in Christ. He's our common ground. It goes on to say, having gifts that differ, or the, this is the next little phrase I want to focus on. We have gifts that differ. And the, the difference and distribution of the gifts is 
fully based on God's plan for us. He chooses who to give which gift to. We were talking last night, um, I don't know if all of you know this, but we have a, a ministry on Saturday nights called SNL, Saturday Night Life. And whoo! And, um, and we just kind of worked through the Gospels. And we were talking about how God has, it, I, I just like to imagine, I think of baby Silas, where God's got Silas while he was still in Alex's tummy. And, and the, the word, it's, me, it's a metaphor, but he says, he knit us together in our mother's wombs. And there's this intentionality to the way we are put together. I hear he's knitting somebody else in somebody else's womb as well, but I'm not going to look at them because I don't know how public the news is. Um, anyway, um, sorry, I'm, this, this is what I mean. I get distracted sometimes. Squirrel. Um, he, he, he has intentional about this creation process. He doesn't just kind of let biology do its thing. It's, it's, there's this intention, of, I'm going to give them this strength, this gift. And along with that gift is, I'm doing it for a reason. There's a purpose behind the gift. And the distribution of those gifts is fully determined by God. He's the one who chooses. So for me to take pride in any kind of gift that I've been given is foolish. All it is is a gift from the Father, all, all it is. But it's got nothing to do with me. It's, it's got to do with the giver who has given me this gift. Not because I'm special, not because I deserve it, but because he's chosen to. And this is a good segue to our next spiritual gift, the gift of leadership. So point five is this, leading. Uh, the Greek word translated rule or govern designates one who is set over others or who presides or rules or who attends with diligence and care to a thing. And that all sounds very formal. Uh, similar to teaching, there are some natural skills that you can inherit and develop um, when it comes to this. But similar to teaching, there's a spiritual gift that leverages the power and authority of God to lead well. When the thing is someone's soul, caring for that soul requires a God-given gift. 1 Timothy 3 says this, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer or leader, he desires a noble task. And that, that's an interesting one, this idea that he desires a noble task. The idea isn't like, good for you. You want to have a place in spiritual leadership, even though that can be a godly desire. The idea is more like this. This is a good and noble, honorable work. And he's writing to Timothy saying, find the right people to lead. This is, this is important. Now, spiritual leadership in the church is not or should not be all about honor and, and titles and glory. I get really self-conscious when people are, are very honoring and they call me Pastor David uh, because it feels like an un, uh, well, unnecessary but um, unmerited title or anything. And, and that shouldn't be what it's all about. Uh, Jesus said, if, anyone, if anybody wants to be first... He should be last of all and servant of all. And Jesus modeled what real leadership looks like. And he was a servant of all. Uh, let's look at Matthew 20, verse 24. And just as far as context going into this, um, what's happened is James and John, these are disciples, and Jesus is two of the, Jesus' disciples. Their mom uh, steps in, and I, sorry, I should not smirk when I talk about their mom, but it, it feels weird that these two grown men have their mom advocating for them, and they, and she's, she's saying, hey, Jesus, when all this is done and we're in heaven, do you think you can kind of set aside a spot for James and John on your right and left hand? She's negotiating a, a, a place in the kingdom of heaven for her, her two sons, trying to kind of push them to the front of the line. And when the other ten heard it, this is verse 24, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever should be first among you shall be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
this idea that the, the ten other disciples were indignant. They were really put out. They, they thought that there was this unique honor being asked for by the mom. And maybe they were one part annoyed that she would ask that question, or, and maybe another part annoyed that they didn't think to ask for it first, and they thought they might be losing their position of closeness and importance to Jesus. Because make no mistake, that's going to that's gonna go to your head. Uh, we taught last night about, about Matthew, the tax collector, being called by Jesus to be a disciple, and how he was a very unlikely selection by Jesus. And it wasn't anything great about Matthew. And yet, it's pretty easy when you've been handpicked by the Son of God to be one of his disciples. That can go to your head. And you can imagine maybe a, a higher place in heaven with Jesus someday. And they were a little bit put out that James and John would be kind of thinking about being pushed to the front. But Jesus starts to teach them this lesson about leadership. He says, it's, it's not going to be like it is with the Gentiles. So, and he was worried about his disciples because they were showing signs of being like the Gentiles where they want to be elevated. They want to be recognized for their position alongside Jesus. And he says, whoever would be great among you should, uh, excuse me, must be your servant. If you want to be great in the kingdom, and this is this upside down teaching that we see so often in Matthew where Jesus says, if you want to be great, you know what? You need to come right to the bottom and serve others. That should be your heart. Because if your heart is to be great and to be above others, you will be humbled. And you will be, you will be lowered in this hierarchy that you hold so dearly. And then he points to Jesus. Well, he, yeah, he points to Jesus as, uh, he points to himself as the son of man. That he didn't come here to serve, excuse me, to be served, but to serve. Real leadership is done for the benefit of those being led. I'm going to say that again. Real leadership is being done for the benefit of those who led, not for the benefit of the leader. And, and this is a spiritual principle. And so it will take on, uh, or the, the gift of leadership, the spiritual gift of leadership should take on these qualities these very humble qualities where it's not about building up or exalting the leader in their gifting. So before you get too excited, even though we said, we read in scripture that we should, it's a noble task to be a leader. But before you get too excited and pray to God, God, make me a leader, realize that what you're praying for is to be a servant of all. You're praying for the opportunity to come under and serve others. I just want to invite the worship team up as we go into James 3. And I, I do have a fair amount more to say here, so walk slowly. James 3 says this, James 3, 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now this verse has taken on, I think, a whole new uh, amplification in 2023. And I think this can be applied quite liberally to both teachers and and leaders. Um, when you put yourself into a, a position of leadership, or when you are inserted in as a leader, and, and make no mistake, teachers are a form, it's a form of leadership. You put yourself in the spotlight, which sounds romantic, sounds exciting, but it, it also puts you under the magnifying glass where you are subject to scrutiny. And uh, I'm going to go off my notes, and I'm going to take a chance here, and I'm going I'm to share an honest reaction. Um, many of you have accidentally gotten to know my brother-in-law. Uh, Dwayne McDonald is with the RCMP, and you've seen him probably on the news quite a bit um, over the last couple of days, uh, responding and speaking about the, the passing of the, the constable from Ridge Meadows here. And uh, we were listening, watching his, um, his uh, news conference, or whatever you call it, and uh, he used the term outraged. And, um, and it, was, it was hard to see him in that, in that position. Uh, but it made a lot of sense. And he started to comment on, on, uh, on something that I see and you probably see quite a bit. Is this, this, growing, um, this growing resentment, maybe, of the police. Uh, growing negative, um, a negative 
expressed. I don't, I don't know if I haven't written this down, so I don't, I don't know if I'm saying this very well. There's negative attitude towards that kind of authority. And you know what? It, it makes sense in the sense that anytime you put yourself in a position of authority, when they sign up to be RCP officers, they do end up getting more scrutiny. Their actions, when they walk into a dangerous situation wearing the uniform, their actions are more closely watched than the actions of the people that they're trying to sometimes maybe break up a fight or save somebody. And people's eyes are on them, and they're, and they're watching carefully. Now we live in a day and age where you bring out your phone and you're recording everything that's happening. They are going to hyper-analyze what happens there. And we see the hard stories where some police officers, and there's a lot of them around the world, some of them make bad decisions. And they're held to a higher strictness. And, and we scrutinize them, and we're really hard on them. And you know what this has done? And I'm going to step away from the example with the RCMP, but with all giftings, it has paralyzed us and it has uh, discouraged us from stepping into and operating in our giftings because we don't want to come under that kind of scrutiny. We, we read this verse, not many of you should become teachers, for you know that we, will, that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So like, I don't want that. I'm going to take that gift, I'm going to hide it away in my closet. I don't want to act in that gifting for fear of being put under the spotlight. And church, that is a selfish sin. When you hold back the gifts that you've been given, that is, is, is acting in selfish, you are denying the blessing that is meant for others through you. And so, I'm not here to preach at you to be kinder to our police officers. Or even, I, this is going to really drive you nuts, be kinder to our prime minister or other leaders. I'm, this is not a, 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 a liberal party line or anything like that. We're called to pray for those in authority over us. Right? Whether you agree with what they're doing, and I'm not going to say one way or the other what I feel. But we're, that's what we're called to do. And so, church, you know what? Uh, it, this is going to come kind of full circle into the, the blessing that I have for you at the end. But I, I don't want you to miss out on working in your gifts because you're afraid of what kind of what might come with that, what attention you might get, uh, what scrutiny you might get as a result of that. All right. While we contemplate this, let's stand and respond in worship. I'm going to wrap up and we're going to have a time of prayer and stuff uh, directly after that. So let's stand and let's sing together. Yes. 
You have a quick seat. Got a couple things. Actually, before I finish with a blessing and before I invite, uh, we're going to have a ministry team again available. They're going to tuck around the corner so they can hear you a little bit better. They might even suggest that um, that you go with them to the office. Doesn't mean you're in trouble. It means it's a quieter place. It's, it's, sometimes it's just kind of hard to, to, to hear and pray with you um, in this room. Um, and also, I just want to remind you, if you want to, if not, if you want to, if you feel called to, uh, to share a prophetic word, um, we want to make time and space for that right now as well. And so just come on up and, um, and, and we'll work that out. But before that, I, I, or while we're kind of praying to that and, and uh, listening to God's tap on the shoulder for that, uh, I've got a couple pictures to share with you and kind of a call. So these are pictures from our Tuesday nights. I don't know if you recognize our office transformed. Uh, the next picture is another angle of what's going on in this room. Um, this is a room full. <laughs> We're getting 25 kids of uh, mostly Spanish-speaking families who are coming here on Tuesday nights for free English classes. And it has exploded. I had no idea we had Spanish speakers, uh, so many Spanish speakers in this area. Um, but one, I've, I've shared this a little bit. One of the things that I'm just learning is that when they come up here on a work visa, they're not allowed to formally study in a certif uh, certificate or diploma program. And so what we offer for free, non-certified uh, English classes uh, with really good teachers, there have been some incredible volunteers who have stepped up, is, is the opportunity to learn the language and still follow the rules of their visa. So it has attracted a lot of people. We've got another couple of pictures of the classes. So this is the boardroom being used. There's only one more class we've got. This is now we've expanded across the street. Uh, I've been working with um, the vicar there, uh, Laurel. She's um, is, is the 
equivalent of a pastor at the same level. She's leading the church over there, and they rented us two rooms, this room, and they actually used the sanctuary um, in that space as well to have another large class there. And then we've got two more classes here that are happening. And I tell you this for a reason. We need people to help with this swarm of kids, this beautiful swarm of kids. We need people to come and help um, and be with them. Uh, and one of the, the things that is in the heart of the, the leaders of our Spanish uh, service leaders is that we don't just babysit these kids. That this is an opportunity to introduce them and point them to Jesus. And so um, whether it means showing them a VeggieTales video or having a coloring sheet or, or having a lesson, this is a ripe opportunity. The harvest is ready. It's ready. We just need the workers. And similarly, if you're gifted in teaching, I didn't even plan this connection. If you're gifted in teaching and you've got time and space to uh, offer your uh, services, your skills, your talents, your gifts, on Tuesday nights, uh, they meet for an hour and a half. And um, it, it's, a, it's a great team that we've started to assemble, but we could use more teachers because there are more students to be had that we're having to turn away. So I want you to consider that. Um, I want to invite you one more time. If there's somebody who's, who's feeling that God's given them a prophetic word to share with our congregation, now would be a great time to come up. Also, can invite the, word, uh, the ministry team to kind of come and assemble, make sure that people know that they're available for to, to pray with you um, after the service. But let me share a blessing. It goes like this. May those gifted with the gift of teaching or leadership be inspired to move and act in those giftings for God's glory. And may those whose gifts are different than these be patient and encouraging of those who dare operate in their giftings. So with that, be blessed. We would love to pray for you. And we will be praying for you. And we invite you also to be praying for Carolee as she leaves this Thursday, early, early, early Thursday morning. Until next week, be blessed.